Introducing ccert.global. If you love the internet, we need your help. So the internet is in a downward spiral, and there's a community to help that. And with me on stage is Edward Drius, who is the global chairman of CCERT, and he will now take the stage. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you very much uh, on this wonderful evening. Uh, I will make it quick tonight, so thank you very much for being here. I want to introduce you to CSERT.global. It is a new foundation, and we want to explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, uh, why we believe that this is an important job, and that we want to ask you for help as well. So first, let me introduce myself uh, nicely. Um, I have been on computers since 1985. Uh, I was quite young back then, so I owned a C64 back then. My first PC, 1991. Um, I fried my first main board shortly after that. Um, started working in IT in 1996. Now, this all is a tremendously long time ago, but what this means for me is that I was here in computer science and computer security since before the internet came about. And I love the internet. You know, the reason why I'm here, I believe, is also that I love the internet very, very much. So from the 90s, I worked for various companies. Um, and um, I started actually doing volunteer work at DIVD in 2021. Shortly after, Victor Gevers, one of the founders of DIVD, asked us, asked me to start CSR.global, which is, in essence, an organization wanting to do the same things as DFVD does, but then internationally. A tremendous honor for me. Uh, how could I say no? I didn't, and I'm, I'm here today. What I want to talk to you about today, very simple story, really, is as much as I love the internet, the internet has a lot of problems. I think the internet is in dire straits. A group of volunteers, and many of them are here today uh, at the front row. Hello, all. Um, are trying to do something about this. And they are tremendously successful. I'm very proud and honored to be working with them. Um, but there is a problem, because many times they not only do research and find vulnerabilities, they even scan the entire internet and find where those problems actually are. But is that enough? That is often not enough, sadly. And this is where CSER.global comes in. We try to take those findings and take them across the home straight. Because only knowing where it is and what the problem is, is not enough. You need to find an owner for a problem who's willing to solve it. Because if you don't, the problem is still there. And that requires a lot of work. And that's what we were here for. Let me first start with what I believe are the biggest problems on the, on the internet. I believe we have TTL problems. And it's not the TTL you might know. It is a different kind of TTL. The first T stands for tech. The internet is created by nice, old, wonderful scientists, confused old scientists maybe, who build this solely on trust. And that is fantastic. But once there are people on that same network that we don't trust, there's no technology to actively counter that. The internet has been suffering from that building on trust and that old school technology ever into the 2020s. Now, we all know the symptoms of this. We, know, we all know we run IPv4 when IPv6 is already decades available and hypothetically way more secure, at least much more difficult to scan, but we don't use it. And a lot of software that we use on the internet is built by for-profit uh, organizations with managers and deadlines, um, time crunches, software supply chains are a mess. Even if you know what kind of software you use, you don't know what's in it, etc., etc. And this means that, for example, at the end of June, when I checked the CVE database, there were 2,292 of them in there. 
and 147 of them had a score of 9 or higher, which means we need to do something essentially right now. So add this to the facts that scanning the internet takes a motivated individual about three hours nowadays. You know, it's, the internet is not that big if you consider. And whenever something happens, like exchange vulnerabilities or whatever, more than 100 individual groups start scanning and are in a red race. Both the good guys and the bad guys trying to outscan each other in order to find the problems. The bad guys want to misuse them. The good guys want to disclose them. So the internet has technology problems. The second problem I believe is there on the internet is trust. There is either too much or too little trust. But there is seldom the right amount of trust at the right time. And this is a problem too, at least this is a problem for us. So look at these three little photographs I'm showing you here. We have Google, we have solar cells, and we have a hacker defacing my website back in 2007. Who of these three you reckon wanted to help me? And you're right, it's not the first two ones. The first two ones we know now, right, there's a lot of trust by the general public in all kinds of technology. Big tech, we all trust Google. We point our DNS service to 8888. We trust our solar suppliers and we trust their app. As DIVD has disclosed, not always a smart thing to do, but how, what, what else can you do? And as a matter of fact, this third gentleman that defaced my website back in 2007, he left a little message where he, I, he could be reached on Jabber. So I did. I contacted him, and it was a Brazilian gentleman, and he told me what was going on. He told me that I had a vulnerability in my OpenSSL implementation in my Apache web server. So it's sometimes not always obvious who you trust or who you can trust. I understand that very well, but one thing that's absolutely true, there's seldom the right kind of trust at the right time in the right process. So trust is a big problem. And then the third TTL problem, the L, is law. Lawmakers don't help us a lot. They are lagging by at least 10 years. And they're pretending like the internet, which is this big, big, giant, global community, is not. It's very difficult to geofence the internet, but they still try to. And they're running their laws, and they're building their laws, and they're building their alliances based on borders. And this is seldomly aligns well to something as fluid and transparent as the internet. Big tech have now more power and leverage than governments. And you can say, well, you know, why should I care? Well, they are not, they don't have a seat in the United Nations. Maybe they should have, but they don't. They make their decisions without a lot of check and balance, and these decisions impact us. And coordinated vulnerability disclosures, there's so many of them, it's treated super different across all of the globe. So, I pulled a news item from, from the internet. This says the Department of Justice will no longer prosecute ethical hackers who try to test security. What do you reckon is the date of this new item? What do you think? This is a US news item. How old is it? Five years? Ten years? How about five weeks? Only five weeks ago, they proposed a law where ethical hackers could not be prosecuted. And this is how vastly different ethical hacking and coordinated vulnerability disclosure is treated all over the world. And that means if we want to scale this process globally, we need to deal with different kinds of laws and jurisdictions. And that means that someone is going to need to do a heck of a lot of boring work. But by golly, we need to do it. Otherwise, this global process will not kick off. 
In essence, no one is responsible. Many organizations take part of the responsibility, but no one is responsible. There is no one responsible for the internet. So, the only thing you can do is taking a little bit of responsibility in areas where you believe you can take a difference. And in 2019, a group of Dutch volunteers probably don't need to know, uh, tell you who they are, but they're the Dutch Institute of Vulner Vulnerability Disclosure, led by Victor Gevers, uh, wonderful other people, Astrid Oosterbrug, Chris van Hof, and many others. They do fantastic work. I'm very proud to volunteer with them today. They do fantastic research. There are two outstanding processes. I, I would say is research, their capability to find and feel what is making a difference in technology today and dive into it, like the solar panels. This is super, super relevant because in large parts of the world, there is uh, a war going on which is impacting energy consumption globally. Everyone wants to dive into solar cells, but now we know that this isn't always without risk for the end user. Kaseya is another prime example of where they felt something wasn't quite right. They thought maybe those MSPs, some of them very small, were using this software to manage their many customers, gaining direct access to their customers' premises and doing all kinds of administrative tasks. Now, of course, when they found it was very much uh, broken and there were a lot of leaks in there, um, this was a huge, huge thing. So they do fantastic research, and they're going to keep doing that, and Glo Caesar Global is going to benefit from that as well. But the second thing that they do very, very well, they are one of those more than 100 organizations that scan the Internet within three hours after something is happening. They not only scan but also the results then get aggregated and run through an informed process. So what they do essentially is send abuse emails. And it is wonderful that they're doing that. They don't need to do that, but they do because they're just wonderful people. They want to take responsibility and they do it very, very well. But informing can be very frustrating, which is why I created a little graph for you. And this graph shows you the measured response on, for example, I think with Exchange, we sent something like 40,000 emails to abuse email addresses or addresses we got out of the security.txt. And this is the measured response. About one in 200 emails got a response saying, oh, wonderful, thank you so much. We love your work, keep, keep it going. Another one in 200 said, go away, you're trying to sell me th something, or I'll call my lawyer if you don't stop hacking me. The other 99% silence, or bouncers. But that's how hard it is if you want to automate your warnings, which are fair and coming from a good heart, people should heed the warnings, at the same time, they don't. So informing can be frustrating, and this is why we need to be global. Because if people don't respond and they don't act on what we can tell them, the problem is still there, the internet is still vulnerable. Speed is security. And in order to be more speedy, we need to build two global things. The first is trust. And the second is an understanding of law and acting according to local ethics. And trust, we believe we can build with our chapter structure. It's there to respect and understand and adapt to local culture. And we aim to build chapters wherever they are needed and allow for people to work under the same principles, the same code of conduct, and the same values as DIVD, but do it internationally within a certain geographical area. But we also need sector access, because every now and then, taking a, a vertical slice from a cake will yield you way more surface instead of a, a horizontal slice. So building bridges to sectors that need us most. And finally, 
We need to build relations with people that can endorse us. We, we should not underestimate, for example, how important it is, especially in the beginning, when you got a scanning email from DIVD, and people were asking, well, who are these guys sending me all these emails about hacking and all that kind of stuff? When the government could tell them, no, you can trust these people. You know, we have absolutely, we have nothing to do with them, but we know them and you can trust them. So these endorsements and building this trust and having someone who will vouch for us, we need to find them as well. And in that way, we can start filling in the little areas in the globe. So in readying for the future, the DIVD board had a very uh, forward-thinking plan, and they split up the initial foundation into several foundations. I think I'm missing even two. Uh, I, I think I'm missing a uh, club, and I'm missing um, uh, maybe another one, but these are essentially the, or the new foundations that are going to do it. DIVD will still be there, for the research and the scan and inform process. And CSR.Global will be the organization responsible to take it internationally. And then we have, of course, wonderful new additions like the DVD Academy and the fund from where we can fund wonderful new forward-thinking pro projects. And within CSR.Global, so this is our responsibility, this is how building this network works. So imagine there is a severe vulnerability. Let's just say um, it's already out there, it has a CV number, it's in the press, whatever. So um, first thing we do is we find if it's scannable. If it's scannable, we do quick research, we create scripts, and we start scanning the entire IPv4 space. That's done pretty fast because there's only 4.29 billion uh, IP addresses, which is not a lot really, not with our infrastructure. Um, and then we try to map the results where we get positive ones to automated emails. These emails then, as we can see in the graph, are ignored, right? And this is where Caesar Global comes in. We take the extra effort. We geographically, um, we send it to our chapter structure to start spreading it locally in individual geographical regions. And we take it through our partnerships into different sectors. For example, um, could be we have make, been making friends with the MSP space. We have been making friends with the NGO space. Um, and these affected parties then may even call their search, their local search, saying, hey, who are these guys? And they will then tell them, oh, you can trust these sort of global. These are good people. You can trust their work. Then more vulnerabilities are mitigated and faster as well. This is the, essentially the design that we want to do, and it will make sure that the giant, giant checkerboard that we're trying to fill is the world relevant to IPv4 space with chapters and with sectors. And we won't rest until we cover the entire checkerboard that is the world, which is 200 countries and Lord knows how many sectors. But building a global trusted CSER network is hard. We have been working quite hard at it. We're actually very proud. We have started our first uh, chapter in the UK. Um, but we need, of course, help. And this is where you come in. You get something as well, because I can tell you from experience, the experience of working with the talented and passionate people is something that will, that will be very, very good for your soul, and I can recommend it to anyone. But you will also meet international new friends, um, and you will get support, and they will definitely help you be a better person and a better professional. This is the promise that Caesar Global will make you. But what we ask is people who believe in making the world a better place, willingness to invest time to fill that darn matrix with us, and we need people to agree with our core values and code of conduct. That's very important. But essentially, we need to conquer the world, we need to do it side by side, and we can't have differences about how we do it. So, 
If this sparks your interest, there's many people you can get in touch with. Uh, you can get in touch with Vincent, Leonard, Marielle, Sharesh, Wietse, myself, any DIVD member, and a lot of them sitting here. Those are the people with the black shirts with the yellow logo on top of it. They can refer you as well. I want to do a big shout out to our co-founder, Victor. I hope people, many people know why. Um, don't call him. Wait a little bit until you do that. But let's all do a big shout out to Victor because he's essentially the reason that many of us are here. <laughs> and I want to do a big shout out to our UK chapter leads, Scott McGreedy, Gerard and Dave. Uh, welcome on board, guys. We are so happy to have you and I will see you in a few weeks. And our supervisory board, um, that's Ronald Prince, Marco Barkmeyer, Michiel Prince, and of course, Edwin van Andel. So, all of these people pivotal in what we do. So, give them a ring, give me a ring if you want to, if you want to see how you can help. Thank you very much for your attention, and hope you have a wonderful MCH. So, we do have some time left for questions. If anyone has a question, please line up at the microphone in the middle. Stand close to it so that we can hear you. Microphone in the front, please. Thank you for the wonderful work. Uh, one question regarding contacting abuse contact. Do you just uh, email the abuse at domain or you just check RIR databases for the abuse contact for the IP address space? like Arian, uh, Apnik, Ripe? Uh, this is actually a question I can better refer right now to DIVD as I do that. Um, I don't know, Kasper, do you want to you wanna take that question? Then yeah, please Leonard? come to the you stage. You want to take that question? Thanks. Leonard Uithorn. You can have my micro. So in contacting people, uh, we use various ways to track down contact information. Uh, abuse information for IP block is one, but preferably a last resort. If you have a domain name from say, a certificate or something, we can of course mail info ads, security ads, etc. at the domain. If they have a website, we can scrape it for security.txt or some kind of privacy contact. And those are the various ways we try to get in contact. Great, thanks. Uh, another question is uh, regarding threat intel, like uh, how do you prioritize like the CVEs? If, for example, a nation states is after one CV, do you go after that or is there any kind of prioritization? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we look generally at risk, at the highest amount of risk to the largest group of people. Um, we try also to be as apolitical as we can in our decision making. Um, so that's typically where we look at. Um, so it, it is a little bit of a, an art, if you will. Um, it, it's super difficult if you look at CVEs, you know, the first two pages, all of them have scored 10, yeah. right? So, so where do you start? And, and, and this is really where the art uh, comes in. Sometimes there's a lot of work being done already by vendors, you know, they're on top of it, they really, you know, they, they know what they're doing, you know, even though it's super bad, you know, let them have at it. And sometimes it's something that we think, well, we think, we think people are really underestimating this one, so we'll invest the effort there. It is an art. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any more questions? If that is not the case, then I would like to thank you for your talk and your work. It was really interesting and great. Good job. So give a nice round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.